sharing good news of great joy to all people. Elation Church. Welcome to Elation Church. We're excited that you're joining in with us today. If you're watching from across Davenport, Claremont, or Kissimmee, we invite you to come be with us every Sunday morning in the gymnasium of Sister Church Academy. Sister Church Academy is just off of Highway 27 on Sand Mine Road, and we would love to meet you there this Sunday. Now, before we look into God's Word, let's pray together. God, we thank you for today. Thank you for the opportunity to come together around your Word. I pray that you would speak to our hearts, illuminate your truth, help it to impact our lives, and change us to be more like Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome to week number four in our series that we've entitled Real Love. You know, we use that word love to describe the way we feel about a lot of different things. Like, I love college football. I love this time of year because I love Saturdays and watching SEC ball games. I, I love fat burgers. I talked about that a few weeks ago. And when I talked about it at our live service, we wound up with over 12 people going to Fat Burgers for lunch that day. So what I shared must have been really good about the greasy chili cheeseburger that they have over at Celebration. But we use the word to talk about football. We use the word to talk about food. But then we use the same word to say, I love my wife. I, I love my family. I love Jesus. I love my church. Obviously, we're not meaning the same thing every time we use that word love. Here's one thing that I am trying to do more and more. I can't say that I've perfected it, but what I like to do now, instead of saying I love college football and I love food, I, I'm going to say I enjoy college football. I enjoy fat burgers, but I love my wife. I love my family. I love Jesus. I love my church. I want to use that word love in a meaningful way. Now, this series is entitled Real Love, and the question that we're looking at is, what is real love? Well, each one of us have ideas about what love is, and they begin being formed at an early age from seeing our parents and our family and our friends and reading books and watching TV shows and movies. We develop our idea, our personal idea of what love is and what love is not. Now, if we look into Webster's Dictionary to look for a definition of the word love, it means this. It means a strong affection for another arising out of kinship or personal ties. It means an affection based on admiration, benevolence, or common interest. It means an assurance of affection. It means a warm attachment, an enthusiasm, or a devotion. That's Webster's definition, and I think that dictionary has a good definition of what love is. But again, each one of us experience love in a unique way. And somehow, even though we all have developed a personal definition of what real love is, and we've developed it from unique things, you know, we feel that our understanding and beliefs are the accurate understanding and beliefs about real love. 1 Corinthians 13 11, and that is considered, chapter 13 is considered the love chapter in the Bible. It says, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. And out of this verse, I want to point out that phrase, now I know in part. You see, we know in part. We don't fully know everything there is to know about love, as we've looked at in previous weeks. God is love. So to understand, to completely, fully understand love, we would have to completely and fully understand God because God is love. Here's the deal. We will not have a full understanding of real love until we see God face to face. When we come down to it, the fact is that none of us 
have arrived. And every single one of us need to grow in love, in real love. So what does the Bible say? What is real love? Where does it come from? What can we know about love and how can we grow in love? 1 Corinthians 14 verse 1 says this, let love be your highest goal. In the New King James Version, it says, pursue love. In the, in the message paraphrase, it says, go after a life of love as if your life depended on it, because it does. So love should be something that we are pursuing. It should be a goal in life. It should be a quest, something that we're running after and pursuing for a long time, not just in spurts, but over a long period of our lives. Now, the Bible reveals, and if you've been with us in this series, you, you remember that the greatest and highest form of love is the word agape, because the, the Bible was written in Koine Greek, and that word agape is the word that it uses when it says God is love and love God and love people as we've looked at those verses. So the definition of that word agape is love, and we've talked about a definition for that. It's also affection, benevolence, and a love feast. So what is affection? Affection is a feeling of fondness or liking. Maybe you've said or you've heard someone say, I, I love you because I have to, because God tells me I have to love you, but I don't like you right now. Well, if you, if you don't like someone, if you're not fond of them, then you're not showing them real love or agape love because that is being fond of someone and liking them. Benevolence. What is that? That's a demonstration or a display of kindness because you are looking out for the well-being of the person that you're showing love to. You always want what's best. And if it's within your power, you demonstrate that by helping them have their best, their well-being. You have another person's well-being at heart. And then a love feast. I mean, when the church gets together for fellowship, there's normally food, but this word and this idea comes from the early church that would get together and people from every class in society would all come together and share a meal together because they were fond of each other. They liked each other. They would get together, share a meal together. They didn't have rich people section and poor people section, slave section, free section. They didn't have all that kind of stuff. They just came together to do life together, to enjoy each other, to share a meal together, and to remember what Jesus had done for them. They would also participate in what we would call communion or the Lord's Supper, and they called that a love feast. Now, we've looked at this verse, really, for the last two weeks. Matthew 22, starting in verse 37, it says this, when they were asking Jesus what was important, he said, Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important, he said, love your neighbor as yourself. This week we're going to be focusing in on loving your neighbor as yourself, and it's interesting that Jesus did use the exact same word, agape, to define what our love should be for God and what our love should be for each other. Now, we've looked at the Greek definition of agape already, and we've looked at it each week. But this week, I want us to take an in-depth look at what I call God's expanded definition. Most of us are familiar with the verses in the middle of the love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13. As a matter of fact, it's, it's a very common passage to put on wedding invitations. I mean, it was on Gana and my, it was on our wedding invitations. We sent it out. 
Um, we have bookmarks that we gave away and you can go to a bookstore and find a bookmark that has 1 Corinthians 13 on it almost everywhere. But let's listen to God's expanded, what I call his expanded definition of agape and agape is real love. 1 Corinthians 13, starting with verse 4, it says this. Maybe you've heard it before. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable, and it keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures every circumstance. Have you ever held a prism in your hand? I remember when I was in school, the teacher pulled out prisms in the science class, and we, we had natural light, white light coming in one side, and then all of a sudden, the prism would take that light and separate it out into individual colors. And I remember learning that white light is actually a combination of several different colors. And the prism actually separates it out. It separates out that spectrum of light instead of us just seeing it as one thing, we see it by what it's made up of. And I believe that's a good description of the love chapter, those verses that we just read. Because we have love, agape, as the white light, and then we have what love is and what love is not and what love doesn't do and what love does coming out the other side. And I want you to think about that as we dig in to each thing that love is, love is not, what love does, what love doesn't do, okay? And as we look at these, I don't want you to say, well, I've heard this before. Here's, here's what I've done. I've, I've looked in to the original language that the original hearers would have heard, and then I'm giving you definitions, expanded definitions, just from our English words that we read when we read through. So, Here's what love looks like. Here's what love looks like. Love looks like patience. Love looks like patience. So if we are going to love like God loves, then we're going to be patient with everyone. Because God wants us to love everyone. So what is patient mean? It means that we're long-tempered. We're not, we're not ready to get angry, and we're, 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 we're long-spirited. That's what the word means, long-tempered, long-spirited. We're not quick to get angry. We're patient with people. So our patience is a reflection of our real love. If we're not patient with someone, then we're not really loving someone in the way that God is love and the way that he wants us to love. We, we have to be patient with people. So just think about it. When is your patience put to the test? What happens to make you, you know, flying off in anger or in rage? I mean, we need to be long-tempered, long-spirited. We need to be patient. And that is a demonstration of real love. What's the next word? To be kind. That's what love looks like. Love looks like kindness. <laughs> so, are we kind? That word kind, when you look at the definition of the Greek, it means to be useful or to act benevolently. So there's that word benevolence again that's Part of the definition of agape. We're, we're really concerned about the well-being of the people around us. We, we're so concerned that we act 
for their well-being. So we're kind. That's, that's what kindness means. It means to act that way, <laughs> right? To, to act like you care about people, that you care about people doing well and being well. That's what real love looks like. Then it goes on to tell us what love does not look like. Well, love does not look like jealousy. It says love is not jealous. Now, the definition of that word that's translated in English, jealous, it means to have warmth of feeling for or against. It's also translated zealous. And it lets us know that this can be good or bad. I mean, it's good to have a warm feeling for the right thing. It's good to be zealous for the right thing. But in context, this is saying love is not jealous. That means that, you know, we're not supposed to be fired up against something that you shouldn't be fired up against. You shouldn't act with jealousy or envy. That's what this word jealous means. You're, you're, you're not, again, I'll just say it again, because I know that you know what it means to be fired up against someone. Right? I mean, we all know what that means. And we shouldn't get fired up against something or against someone that we shouldn't be fired up against. Because we need to be forgiving. Right? We don't need to get mad. It's just like we were talking about impatience. It kind of works together in context. So what does love not look like? Love is not boastful. That word boastful means to vaunt itself. It means to brag. It means to boast. So if you're going to display love to another person, you don't just talk about yourself all the time. You don't just talk about all the wonderful things that you've done and all the wonderful things that you're doing and you don't just brag on yourself and your abilities and your talents and, and your dreams and hopes. No, you're, that's not love. Because real love is concerned about others, not boastful about yourself. What else does love not look like? Well, love is not proud and you might think that those are the same, but there, there's a little difference between the last word of being boastful and being proud. Proud means to inflate or make proud. Proud means to present yourself as being superior to or better than others around you. You know, if we're honest, we have to sometimes say that when people that we run into that, well, you know, we, we feel superior. Maybe by our income, maybe by our education, maybe by our abilities. We, we can sometimes feel superior, but when we, when we do that, that's not demonstrating love. To think that we're better than anyone else. Okay? What else does love not look like? The Bible says that love is not rude. Do I have to explain what being rude is? <laughs> the, the definition of the Greek word is to be or act unbecoming. And I can put it this way, to talk or act ugly towards another person. I mean, that's about as plainly as I can put it. But, but when you really love somebody, real love does not talk ugly to other people or act ugly towards another person. Are you being convicted yet? I mean, I believe all of us, when we start looking at this definition, this expanded definition that God has given us, I think all of us can see that we have room to grow. What else does love not look like? Well, love is not irritable. Love is not irritable. Love is not easily provoked. Love is not easily stirred up. Love is not easily offended. 
to put it in an easier way to understand, love does not walk around with a chip on your shoulder, just daring somebody to look at you the wrong way so that you can be irritable, provoked, stirred up, or offended. That's not love. If we live our lives that way, we're not demonstrating the love of God. Real love. What else does love not do? What does it not do? Well, the Bible says that love keeps no record of being wronged. Let this one sit there a minute. How easy is it for us when somebody says something wrong or does something wrong towards us that we get offended, you know, because all this is working together, right? We get offended by something, and then how often do we tuck that away in our mind, and then when we get into an argument, all of a sudden, we pull up something. Well, you said this five years ago, or you did this to, you let, hello? So real love doesn't keep records of being wrong, especially to be used as weapons later. So what is that telling us? Real love doesn't hold on to feelings and memories of being hurt and react to something from our past. That's not demonstrating real love. That's not real love. What does love not do? Well, the Bible says that love does not rejoice about injustice. What does that mean? That means that love doesn't get cheerful or happy when someone else messes up. When someone does something wrong in their character or their life or their actions, how easy is it if someone hasn't been showing love to us for us to like, well, they got what was coming, right? I'm, I'm glad they got what I'm glad they got what they deserved. No. <laughs> Real love does not get cheerful or happy over wrongness of character or wrong life decisions, wrong actions. Love doesn't get happy about those things when they happen to other people. What does love do? The Bible says love never gives up. I'm going to say that again. Because all of us have got to the point where with other people, in relationships, and in the, when things aren't going perfect, you know, all of us have that temptation to just give up. But real love, the love that God is, and the love that God wants for us to demonstrate to Him and to everyone around us is a love that doesn't give up. What does love do? Love remains. Love bears. Love perseveres through every situation. That's love. Real love is looking for a way to remain in love and, and looking past mistakes and faults and, and what we're going to get out of it. And, and love, just, love just wants to love. <laughs> love is loving. It, it continues. It perseveres even through difficult situations. What does love do? Love never loses faith. Never loses faith. What does love do? Love covers everything with silence. As we, as we look at the definitions of these words, it tells us that love covers with silence. I mean... Sometimes our flesh gets stirred up and, and we want to retaliate. We don't want to walk in love because someone else isn't walking in love or, or we're impatient. And you know what? Real love covers everything with silence. Can we grow in that? To not give someone a piece of our mind or I'm going to let you know what I'm thinking. A real love 
stays in faith about the relationship and it covers everything with silence. What love does, the Bible says that love is always hopeful, filled with hope, expectation of good. Expectation of good. That's love. That's real love. It's always expecting good. Now, as we've looked at these definitions, as we've looked at love coming through one side of the prism and then, it, and then the definition, the expanded definition that God has given us, even though that's not everything we could ever know about love, you know what? It's a lot for us to deal with, right? But I would just want to remind you, the Bible is not referring to some special type of love just reserved for your spouse or, or a family member or a close friend. No. We're supposed to love everyone. It says love your neighbor. It's not talking about just a person living beside you. It's talking about every other human on the face of the earth. It's to, that's how the Bible says it. That's how we're going to show the world that we're followers of Christ. I recently heard a quote from Gandhi and he was talking about Christianity and he said this, he said, you know, I, I really respect your Jesus and I, I see how awesome your Jesus is, but I don't see that in the people who say they're following him. The Bible says, everybody around us, they're going to know that we are Christ's followers. They're going to know that we are Christians by the way we love. That's why love is important. That's why when we started, I said, love should be our goal. We should be pursuing love as if our life depended on it. As I looked at those verses from different translations. That's the way we're supposed to love everybody, not just the people closest to us. And I want to let you know, we can only love like that by being constantly filled, by constantly yielding to the Holy Spirit. We're allowing God who is in us to flow out of us. The love of God, we, we, we get to know the love of God at salvation and, and the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of us and the fruit of the Spirit, the very first one the Bible mentions is love. And, and you know, God, God wants us to love like He loves. Love like Jesus loved as He walked on this earth for those 33 years as He stepped down out of heaven and walked on the earth. Love like He loved. The Holy Spirit wants to conform us and transform us into the image of Christ because we are the only Jesus that people are going to see. If they don't see him in us, it's going to be hard for them to see him. And the Holy Spirit desires to work in each one of our lives to conform us into the image of Christ and to empower us to live kingdom-minded lives, God-minded lives. That's how we're going to make a difference. It's to be love people because God is love and we are his people. Natural human love, which I call a less than substitute of love. Anything below agape is a less than substitute. You know what? That natural human love, it often fails and we can look even at times in our lives where when we were operating in natural human love that that love failed. But real love, as that text completes, it says in Romans, or I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, after it goes through the definition of love, it goes on to say this, love never fails. Real love, agape love, 
will never fail. And that's the kind of love that we need to increase in every day. Let's pray together. God, thank you for your truth. Thank you for your word. Holy Spirit, we ask you to take this truth from your word and continue to work in us and through us and help us to be, you know, that the fruit of love that needs to be developed in our lives. Help us to increase and increase and increase. God, we want to yield to you. We want to yield to you. We know we can't accomplish this in our flesh, but we ask you to empower us to love. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks again for being with us today here at Elation Church, and thanks for being a part of our Elation family. If today's message was encouraging to you, would you consider sharing it with your friends? All you have to do is hit that share button right under the video. In doing that, you're coming alongside of us in our mission. And our mission is to bring good news of great joy to all people. We'll see you right back here next week at Elation Church. This online worship experience was brought to you by the friends and partners of Elation Church.